usually, uh, <clears throat> as Eric pointed out, I am a retired Navy chaplain, and I would normally wander around and, and speak, but we're videotaping and uh, for our leadership, and so she's asked that we, uh, that obviously I sit close to the microphone so that the videotape will actually work. Um, my goal this morning is to give us a, a historical background in terms of religion and security. And uh, obviously it's going to be a very broad brush because in 20 minutes uh, I'm going to cover uh, well over a thousand years. And, uh, <laughs> and of course that's going to be quite a challenge. So it will be in fact a, a very broad brush as I approach that. First of all, just a number of uh, points that I would like to make. Number one, that we are religious, that religion is with us, has been with us uh, for all time, and uh, will continue to be so as uh, all of us uh, respond to that uh, void within and fill it with a relationship with, with a God or with a higher power higher than ourselves. And we see that uh, people of like mind and like spirit come together to worship that God uh, in a, in universally uh, across the human race. <coughs> We also understand that man is by nature, as uh, Aristotle pointed out, political. Uh, when we did this two years ago in Washington, D.C., I, I put this slide on the front and everybody laughed immediately. It was like this is a given, everyone understands that we are, in fact, political and that it is a, an important part of what we do, that we are social, gregarious by nature, and that we come together uh, to govern our affairs uh, through our uh, political processes. Historically, uh, people of good mind and, and positive outlook and, and best of intentions have brought together religion and politics for the purpose of bettering our social systems, our uh, uh, group life, our approach to uh, living. And usually that has worked out very well, but many times it has not worked out well. And uh, here at the War College, uh, one of the, uh, the uh, theorists that we point out, now this is in the, the Mahan room, and uh, the Han reading room, if you will. He's one of the naval theorists, but we also talk about the, uh, the uh, army uh, theorist, uh, uh, Karl von Clausewitz. And uh, one of the dictums that we all learned is that uh, war is a continuation of politics by other means. It's a very important uh, aspect of what we do uh, at the Navy War College. It's teaching what that means and how we actually apply that. Well, the reality is when you bring religion into politics, one of the natural responses is, in fact, war. And uh, here we see uh, uh, Victor Davis Hanson, his uh, approach, and that uh, you know, as we mix the political with the religious, then unfortunately, war can easily become the father of us all. And uh, that's why we're here to talk about that intersection, if you will, of religion with politics and war. Now, what I will do this morning is I will talk uh, just very briefly three historical uh, il illustrations. I will talk about how we tried to solve some of those issues through uh, the secular secularization process, if you will, and then the recognition that, hey, religion is still with us. It uh, has always been there, and uh, it's uh, a part of who we are and our whole uh, uh, paradigm and, and, and system. So uh, the Crusades. Now, we all uh, understand about the Crusades that uh, uh, they're still with us that uh, when people talk about the evils of religion, they often bring up the Crusades and all that occurred during that time. Uh, the Crusades are often referenced as a continuing divide between Christianity and Islam. And how is it that we were able to take a peaceful Christian religion and turn it, if you will, into one that would uh, wield the sword in such a way? Well, two principles had to be established, I would suggest. First of all is the, the issue of a Christian republic that people were attempting to establish upon the earth. Now, as a former chaplain, you know, I know very well the, uh, the scriptural background that Jesus taught that there would indeed be a spiritual kingdom within us and that people, his disciples, either understood or misunderstood that. And they argued, for instance, uh, whether one would sit on his right or one would sit on his left. Uh, and, of course, the scriptures relate that there will be a future spiritual kingdom that descends upon the earth, but it is, of course, fallen far in the future, and it is at the behest of God. In the 11th century, however, with bishops and popes and divine right kings, it seemed like it was a perfect time uh, to institute that uh, heavenly realm upon the earth. And, of course, uh, when uh, Pope Urban II made that call, he met with uh, widespread popular support and of course, most of Europe marched off to war, uh, as we know. 
A second principle had to be established, and that is, how can you turn a peaceful religion into one, again, that, uh, uh, that wields a sword? And the point is, is that Jesus said, you know, if somebody strikes you, what do you need to do? Exactly, turn the other cheek. Uh, when Peter drew his sword, Jesus told him, put it away. It's enough. You don't need to be utilizing the sword in such a way. In the early church, if you were a military man who had gone off to war, you were not welcomed uh, into all of worship. Uh, oftentimes, uh, you had to actually go off and do uh, penance for six months before you could actually participate, and you were uh, excluded from, the, uh, from communion. However, uh, with the uh, advent of political power uh, within the church, there became that need for a rationale for utilizing the, uh, the violence, that politics, you know, in fact, and governance, in fact, wields the, uh, the power of violence, if you will. That's part of what uh, uh, politics and governance does. And so we have actually the beginning uh, with the power going to the church, the Catholic Church, you have what we call the uh, just war tradition under Augustine. And uh, how do we come to that understanding and rationale and, and, and reasoning, really? And of course, uh, what happened is that Augustine and, and all those who followed were able to take what was called the, the central truth of Christianity, the law of love, of taking care of your neighbor, and translate that into being responsible to return to the neighbor uh, one's uh, property that had, that had been taken away, and uh, to actually then utilize violence in a way that we hope would be cauterizing or uh, good for those that uh, we are actually applying it to. Uh, even as a doctor would cauterize a wound or amputate a limb. And so violence uh, uh, became the, the call of the day as uh, all of Europe marched off to war. Of course, uh, starting uh, uh, a little bit later, we have the Reformation, all the violence that went on with that. 1555, the Treaty of Augsburg, Cuius uh, Regio and Cuius Religio. Please excuse my seventh grade Latin, uh, which is the last time I took it. Uh, but the Treaty of Augsburg brought to an end uh, the violence of the Reformation, but actually provided the basis for the future wars in Europe, the Thirty Years' War, uh, 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 1848. In that, it uh, provided for a unity on the local level within governance, as each prince was actually then in uh, charge of the religion, or actually the, the religion of the prince became the religion of the local realm. But it, uh, it provided unity at the local level, but broke the unity of the international level, the, the glorious church, if you will, and provided the polarization that would bring about the Thirty Years' War. And of course, uh, we understand that during that time, the uh, actors on the stage were Calvinists and Lutherans who were not recognized, and Catholics. And of course, violence became the order of the day, and actually became the measure of one's faith. How violent you were became the measure of your faith, which was very unfortunate. Many martyrs uh, went to their deaths during this time, holding on to their faith, holding on to their belief system, and refusing to, uh, to give in to those that would kill them. And then, of course, we have the uh, English uh, Civil War, 1640 to 58. And, of course, the actors on the stage here were Puritans, Calvinists, those who would follow the Church of England, the Book of Common Prayer, Parliamentarians, Royalists, and who else? Uh, Irish, and all sorts of other folks. And, of course, the, uh, the key individual on the, uh, on the political uh, realm at that point was... Uh, Oliver Cromwell. And for English, he is a, a saint. Many of the English, he is actually a saint. For the Irish, he is a devil for many of them. And uh, he is still remembered for some of the battles that took place in Ireland in which he uh, uh, failed to take any captives whatsoever and killed all men, women, and children, all in the uh, name of his faith. And of course, the things that uh, Cromwell instituted were blasphemy laws. He uh, instituted a complete freedom of religion for Puritans and for nobody else. Uh, and uh, it was very difficult, obviously, uh, instituting uh, Puritan morals and teaching and ethics throughout the realm. Uh, so as I say, uh, obviously uh, uh, a very mixed uh, result in terms of who he was. <coughs> One of uh, his uh, uh, officers was said to have uh, said before he died he'd been wounded in battle. He said, the only thing that I regret in my death is that I can no longer serve as the executioner of our enemies. 
unfortunately. <coughs> well, uh, of course, uh, peacefully minded people and Christians and uh, others uh, in that time attempted to bring about uh, uh, a resolution to these issues. And so we have the uh, Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, in which uh, the goal was to remove religion from the calculus of the time and to actually institute uh, uh, interest of state, if you will. And uh, this is actually pictured as a dividing line, the watershed in history, in which now we uh, remove uh, confessional politics from the realm and now the, the state, uh, interest of state becomes the, the key focus. Now, I don't want to state that this is, uh, it all happened at once. Obviously, there was an evolution that lasted for many years and with very different results, as we all know. Uh, some of the, the states of Europe, you know, we have actual state churches. Uh, others uh, have a different approach. We have the approach in the, in the United States where we have complete separation of church and state and, and the secular on one side and then, of course, the, uh, the religious on the other. We have uh, John Locke who returned from Europe where he observed the movement that was taking place in terms of uh, the secularization, if you will, the removal of confessional politics. And where, in fact, as a result of the Treaty of Westphalia, where there was the recognition now of Lutherans and Calvinists and Catholics, and all of them were supposed to, because of this treaty, to work together. And if they had confessional differences, were supposed to work out their differences in a peaceful way rather than resorting to the, the sword. Uh, Locke came back to England in 1689 uh, with the reestablishment of, uh, of uh, Protestantism there. And uh, he wrote this uh, book, very important book, called uh, the uh, uh, toleration, okay? the, the letter on toleration, which is very important. And uh, in the same way that his thinking uh, was translated later to uh, the Americans, where the, the founding fathers adopted his, uh, his, many of his principles, especially the, the, uh, the pursuit that we have of life, liberty, and in his words, property, he also uh, communicated this uh, in his letter of toleration, this principle that the church, actually three principles. The first principle was, that the realm of people like Tim and I, who used to be Navy chaplains, the realm of those folks is, oh yeah, the church, and the care of people's souls. The realm of the magistrate or the politician was, oh yeah, government, and taking care of government. Seems like it's obvious to all of us, right? Uh, and that this is the point that he sought to establish through this letter, that we should tolerate one another, and also that there is a boundary fixed and immovable between the church and the, the magistrate. And of course, this principle is then picked up later by Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, uh, as we read about the Establishment Clause, as we understand in our U.S. Constitution, the Bill of Rights, that uh, there shall be no uh, law making uh, concerning the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And Thomas Jefferson's principle, a firm wall dividing the two between uh, the church and the state. So we come to this uh, element of, uh, of the secularization uh, thesis. Now, uh, if uh, you took uh, international affairs and political science during the 1970s, as I did, uh, this was part and parcel of our education at that time. And uh, we were told that, in fact, as a, you know, the, through the thought of uh, Marx, uh, Weber, and Durkheim, that uh, all of society was modernizing and was moving away from religion, that in fact religion was uh, no longer really important, that uh, all of the structures of society were now out from under what Peter Berger later would call the sacred canopy, and were now in fact becoming secularized. And uh, the point was that we were not dealing with religion in that context, that everything was secular, modern, and therefore had left the passions, if you will, of religion. And as we see here, Peter Berger in his, uh, uh, in his book, the, the Sacred Canopy, which I read in Dan Cowden's courses back a few years ago when I was working on my PhD, he's in the back row. Thank you, Dan, for being here. Um, said, you know, postulated that, in fact, uh, there is a secularization process that has gone, you know, begun in uh, the modern West, but has uh, translated through the entire world, and that religion today uh, is not important, and, uh, and so on. And of course, that was uh, communicated into our uh, political realm, our diplomats, because they were taught the same thing in the leading schools of our nation. And Madeleine Albright uh, tells us that as, as she was uh, dealing uh, as former Secretary of State in the Carter administration, that uh, they were completely surprised when uh, a guy in a beard and long robes 
was able to, in 1979, to completely embarrass the United States uh, in capturing the embassy in, uh, in Iran and completely reversing U.S. efforts uh, in that area. In her book, uh, Mighty and the Almighty, she con comments uh, uh, extensively on her experiences there and comments that, in fact, there was nothing that was more treacherous as far as the uh, State Department and diplomats were concerned, that they were taught not to speak about religion and not to you know, mix it with politics, just like our parents taught us when we were young, that uh, if you're in polite company, these are things that you do not bring up, uh, religion and politics. Of course, that's what we're dealing with uh, in these uh, days uh, here. <laughs> Uh, and we will speak about both of them extensively. And uh, so this was the, uh, the realm, if you will, of the political uh, at, the, at that time, and uh, that our diplomats, in fact, uh, ignored these issues, and not only ignored them, but kept them as far away as possible. However, uh, starting in, 19, in the 1990s, we have a completely different uh, understanding, as a result of, of course, our experience in Iran with uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini, and uh, the, the dawning realization, if you will, on the part of our diplomats, that in fact religion was a key element uh, in our world. And uh, so Samuel Huntington, 1993, in his Foreign Affairs article, uh, The Clash of Religions, with a question mark, as he put it, in his later book of a uh, similar title, uh, said that there is actually in our world today a clash of uh, multiple civ uh, civilizations, that the dividing line between those civilizations is culture and that religion is a primary aspect of culture. Now, very few people actually agreed with Huntington at that time. As a matter of fact, he raised a great deal of uh, disagreement, and uh, uh, the, the, of course, it wasn't necessarily the internet at that time, but uh, the, the whole realm of uh, uh, literature was inundated with uh, responses to Huntington, and uh, you did not find many that agreed with him. But the interesting thing was, is that he raised the issue, and that uh, the discussion then focused in that particular area. And of course, many disagreed with him. That was fine, because it was in fact the point that he was uh, raising the issue. And then of course, uh, uh, this whole I issue of uh, intercivilizational clash of cultures and religion. Berger in 1999 points out something else. He says, uh, before I go to, to Berger again, you know, he was the one that uh, said in the, an earlier work, The Sacred Canopy, that uh, uh, the world was going secular. There's another book, uh, 1994, by Doug Johnson and uh, Samson, titled Religion, The Missing Dimension of Statecraft. Very important book. If you haven't read it, I suggest that you do. But in it, he pointed out that, in fact, religion is an important part of the international realm, and that it, has, it had, in fact, damaged U.S. diplomacy and international relations because we had failed to actually recognize it. And he made strong recommendations in the book about, uh, about establishing within the State Department a cadre of professionals who would understand religion, study religion. Uh, he actually suggested utilizing uh, chaplains like myself and Tim to uh, educate uh, folks within the State Department and to be utilized as resources in the realm of religion. And then, of course, 1999, uh, Peter Berger uh, once again says, hey, Religion has not gone away, it's still there, it's still an important part of the international realm. And uh, we need to pay attention to it. It's uh, uh, the, the resacularization of the world, or the desecularization of the world. I would suggest it never went away, it was always there. And that uh, as we talk about the uh, Cold War later, uh, we understand that many of those passions were tamped down by ge geopolitical uh, realities of the time and the strong powers that existed. And of course 9-11 came along, and uh, we understood that uh, religion had uh, been hijacked, if you will, a peaceful religion, in order to justify attacks on the United States. And since then, uh, of course, the uh, forces like this that we are a part of today have been a part of our, of our world. And we understand that, in fact, religion is important. However, uh, Paul, and Paul Ed Otis, who is another individual who often speaks in our conferences, uh, has pointed out that religion is a part of pretty much every current conflict around the world. It's a part of it, it's not everything, it's not nothing, but it's an important part in terms of uh, what we understand. So, of course, there are a lot of, uh, uh, just a ton of uh, conflicts going around the world in which, of course, uh, uh, religion is a part, and of course, you'll have our slides, so we don't need to go into all of those. We would spend days and weeks 
just talking about each of the issues within uh, those areas. So we see that religion has uh, both uh, looking at history and our experience, religion certainly has stabilizing factors in our world today. Um, of course, people of like mind, uh, all of our religions have a peace uh, focus. Uh, as Christians, as Muslims, Buddhists, whatever religion we're a part of, there is in fact a peace focus and peace desire on the part of, uh, of well-intentioned people. Uh, and of course, uh, around the world, religious leaders serve as uh, conduits of peace, of social well-being, and have a, a positive impact in their, in their, uh, in their uh, realm, in their environment. And of course, uh, I understand that it provides common ground for people of diverse cultural backgrounds. If two people of religion come together, uh, we obviously immediately have something to talk about, which uh, is good, and uh, we can appreciate that. Uh, even in Afghanistan and Iraq, as, uh, uh, as religious chaplains have been in those places, uh, they have immediately had uh, relationships with imams in the local area, again, based on religion, not necessarily that they believe the same thing, but that they had a common spiritual ground and, and hope for themselves and for their world. And of course, uh, it is also destabilizing. And, and, you know, uh, when war is uh, imbued with religion, it's more violent, it takes longer, it's harder to uh, resolve, and uh, intensifies and complicates all, all issues relating to, uh, to war. And so, Hopefully, my goal, my desire, would be to separate religion from war if that, if that was possible. But, it probably isn't, because religion is a part of human nature, and of course war is a part of human nature as well. And I'm going to, uh, I actually have some recommendations in my, uh, in my paper that I will uh, share with you. I won't spend a lot of time on those right now. Uh, we'll be actually discussing those uh, throughout uh, uh, the conference. But I'm going to turn it over to uh, Eric Patterson at this point, as he'll share with us. Places 
that have much weaker forms of government or the role of clerics. Think about how large the budget of an organization like World Vision is compared to the budget of a small place like the Central African Republic or Burundi. And those religious actors and ideas and identities are often transnational. Now, whether that's being a member of the global Roman Catholic Church and this, this unique tie over the past year that we've seen that many Catholics have felt to the new pope, or if it's money networks that are based along confessional lines that are supporting terrorism abroad somewhere, there's, a, there's many, many ways that the notion of being a part of an UMA or a part of a citizenship that's, that's faith-based transcends borders. It's a different notion of citizenship. And of course, something that faith brings into the calculus is something that Dane mentioned on a slide about peace, and that is that religion can help individuals transcend what we might consider to be their, their, their natural self-interest. It's Mother Teresa washing lepers with her bare hands. It's also the motivation for a suicide bomber. I mean, for us in the West, a suicide bombing usually doesn't comport with our notion of material self-interestedness, which is often the basis for how we think about human relations. But certainly, there are other factors in other cultures that can drive this. What I'd really like to leave you with, in short, is that it is a simple framework for thinking about, is there really religion in this conflict, and what is it? And the conceptual framework is quite simple. Uh, religious variables can directly or indirectly, and usually indirectly, impact or induce or exacerbate conflict. And it's worth asking yourself the question, when you think about Northern Ireland, or Lebanon, or Sudan, or Iraq, or Israel and its environs, it's worth asking the question, so what is religious in this conflict, and what's not? Uh, as Dane said, religion isn't everything, but it's not nothing. It's something. So first, a, a religion can have a, a fact, it can be a driving influence directly if someone says, well, God if, told me to do it. By the way, when you think about most conflicts today, that's very rare. Very few people are saying, I had a divine revelation. <clears throat> now, Joseph Coney, on your right there, he actually says this. He says that the spirits load through me, that's his language, and that they tell me what to do. But it's pretty rare for people to say that scripture tells me today, or I heard a voice that tells me today to go out and perpetrate political violence. A second way that religion can directly influence violence is when religious actors, based on their authority in the pulpit, so to speak, use that authority to justify violence. And certainly that's one of the ways that religion was a part of the Bosnian Wars, is if you have, say, for instance, a Serbian priest say, because of my authority as a priest, I am telling you, my parishioners, that such and such is justified. So the power of the pulpit. Uh, a third way is when someone is what we might call a religious entrepreneur. And so they don't have the formal standing. Osama bin Laden didn't have the formal standing as a trained ayatollah or as a trained imam. And he didn't say, I heard the voice of God. What he said more or less was, as a private citizen, I see that my religion, the religious establishment, the country I come from, Saudi Arabia, it is corrupt. It's corrupted by Western influence and by greed. And in a sense, I am calling for a reformation. We're going to tie back into historic Islam. We're going to promote jihad. We're going to push back the infidels. We're going to fight the near enemy and the far enemy. And so his, his legitimacy comes from being a member of the confessional community and his understanding of the faith not his position, and not a direct revelation. Again, not all that common. The fourth one here, you might think of in terms of the India context, is when religion sacralizes or makes sacred a place. And of course, there's only one place. That's not negotiable. Or a thing, maybe a scripture, a copy of the Quran, for instance. And so there's a perceived obligation I have to protect this, or I have to avenge this. But certainly that is one of the motivations that Dane talked about a thousand years ago with Crusades, one of multiple motivations. 
In the context of India, what we've had happen in the past 20 years is often Hindu nationalists say, you know, that piece of terra firma, there's only one of it, and there used to be a Hindu temple there. We're going to burn down the mosque. That's a violation of our faith. We're going to burn down that mosque, and we're going to reestablish a temple on that spot. And that's really a non-negotiable because it's only one spot. It's only one place. And so often sacred spaces become a locus of conflict. People often will go outside of the church. This happened in Kenya three years ago, or four years ago, in the presidential elections. It wasn't that they were attacking the church. It's that that's where they knew the people were that they wanted to kill. Right? It becomes a focal point. But once you desecrate a house of worship, all of a sudden it raises the ante specifically. So each of these are a means of saying, oh, because I'm thinking about such and such conflict that seems to be erupting in the country that I follow. Is religion playing this role? Now, religious factors can also take a, 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 a less direct role. They can be kind of swallowed up into a larger uh, collective or confessional narrative. Let me give you a couple of examples of this. The first one you see here is when religion is a part of differentiating sociocultural groups. So think for a second, Northern Ireland. Was any Catholic killing any Protestant over how many books are in the Bible? Or the role of the Pope? Or how to do theology? And of course the answer is no, right? It was not a religious war in any of those senses. But the way that the communities were structured the, one of these historic differences was based on faith community, even among people who don't go to church. By the way, if you're skeptical that I'm right on this one when it comes to Northern Ireland, because we've heard all through our life that it was Protestants versus Catholics, ask yourself this question. Is Sinn Féin and the IRA Catholic? And what you'll find is that they've been very critical of the Pope and of the institutional Catholic Church over the years. And they were really a kind of a traditional, secular, left-of-center uh, type of nationalistic movement. And they don't get much credit for that. Think about Lebanon. Did people, were people killing over religion during that terrible 20 years of civil war? Were Maronites killing Sunnis over faith? No, it was about politics, it was about access to power, it was about economics. However, what is the breakdown of communities the way that they, in a pluralistic society, how they competed in the past, they've competed in part by violence, and they've competed based on confessional communities. That's, the, I, I would call that really an indirect role for religion. Yeah, you see here the MNLF and the MILF in uh, the Philippines. Now, many of you know that in the 1950s, the Moro National Liberation Front, with its kind of call for Ben Samoro, for a uh, uh, an ethnic identity in an autonomous region within the Philippines. And you see their symbols there in the upper left. I mean, this looks like many of the, the anti colonial types of symbols that you saw during the Cold War. Look at the colors. Red is prominent. There's the machete. The text is in English. Hey, Hassan, welcome. Welcome. The, and you have the, the small Islamic symbol there, but this was really, in a sense, this was not a religious movement. 50s and 60s and the 70s. By the late 70s, though, as many of you know, that a splinter group that becomes quite powerful and was quite violent in the 1980s emerges called the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. And here's the shift, and you can just see it very simply in their, uh, in their new constituted graphic below. This is their symbol. Instead of the revolutionary red, the color of Islam, green. Instead of English text, the Arabic text. The prominence of right at the very center of the image of the crescent of the star. And this was part of a larger appropriation of Islamic motifs and symbols and language and a call to unity that was based on faith, shared faith, shared Islamic identity instead of ethnic identity alone. And so it's often when religious symbols are manipulated or used by elites. That's often how religion becomes a part of an already existing period of tension. Well, the, the same dynamics are true when it comes to peace. Religious factors, 
religious actors can be a driving force, can be a part of efforts towards peace, both directly and indirectly. One is this, when someone has a sense, uh, a divine sense, either through scripture, or they've heard the voice of God to tell them directly, I'm calling on you to be a peacemaker. Now, we don't have a lot of people who seem to say, well, I heard the voice of God telling me to do that. But we do have quite a few people who say, my understanding of our scriptural tradition is that we have an injunction to serve. A, 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 a related form is when an individual or a group has a sense of calling or vocation. Well, my understanding of my role within our religious community, my vocation, or we're called to serve as peacemakers. Uh, we've seen this in the Mennonites over the past 40 years. We see this among some Quakers. Certainly the kind of driving force in South Africa on the Desmond Tutu side of the aisle was an understanding of his faith and of Christianity as an opportunity to engage on behalf of peace. Now, South Africa was not a war. What you'll find is lots and lots of the peace and reconciliation literature that pretends to be about war talks about South Africa and the TRC. There was no war. But it's worth asking the counterfactual, why is that the one country among its neighbors that didn't fall into civil war? And certainly among all of the factors that are there, the role of Christian communities in particular in working towards reconciliation is a, is a part of the story. Now, something that religion brings that very little other uh, ideologies or partisan movements can bring is this notion of redefining the conflict from us versus them to, you know, we're all children of God. Religion can reframe those types of relationships and we've seen those things happen in places like Rwanda. And religion has something that very few other things can offer. And that is, is that people of faith believe, and I believe, that in some instances, faith can help transcend the situation. It can transcend it through acts of service. It can transcend it through acts of reconciliation. It can transcend it through acts of forgiveness usually at the individual level, but in some rare cases at the political level. Let me mention one great story. By the way, uh, if you don't mind my saying, uh, I love religious peacemakers. There isn't a ton of evidence that they've really stopped a lot of wars. But there is a, a powerful case, and that is the Civil War in Mozambique. Most of you know that when uh, Portugal pulled out in the early 70s, that essentially all of its former colonies fell in the Civil War. So that was true. East Timor was annexed by Indonesia, Mozambique, uh, Angola, et cetera, kind of descended into civil war. And in the Mozambique case, that war lasts for more than 15 years. How did they get to the peace talks? I mean, the story is quite interesting that a Catholic lay organization based in Rome called Community San Judea is the one who brokered the peace talks. And how did they did, do so? Well, it's that through their charitable work, that they developed relationships with both sides, and that they were seen as a trusted agent for communiques between Philemon and Renato. They then brought the parties to meet in Rome. They met at a soccer game. Uh, a soccer game was the venue for pulling aside privately off the radar, and over time, community San Egidio and these parties brought in the Italian government the United States, the United Nations, to help bolster the process. But this is a case where it was clearly religious peacemakers that made the critical, the unequivocal difference in whether or not there was going to be peace at that time based on the conditions on the ground. That's a very, very powerful case. By the way, in the Philippines case that we looked at just a little bit earlier, uh, in many <coughs> ways it's just been in the past year that it looks like finally an autonomous region and an agreement has been reached. That's another case where religious actors have played a role, and where the, the Philippine government, including by bringing in um, Catholic peacemakers to train its military about how to do peacemaking and reconciliation initiatives at the village level, that's been one of the vectors there as well. I could tell you other stories, but I think we'll uh, move on to the uh, Q&A in just a moment. I would say this. When a conflict starts in many parts of the developing world, I bet you would find that there are religious groups already there meeting the needs of the most vulnerable. In 
Catherine Marshall tomorrow to talk more about this. And when whatever the flavor of the month fad of intervention is goes away, whether it's, oh, remember Sudan, or if it's, hey, let's put some extra money here or there, when, 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 the, when the government agencies start to go away, it'll be religious actors running the orphanages still, providing food to the poor. You know, the, the top seven hospitals in Africa every year, they're all run by faith-based organizations. That, that's a part of this larger, when we talk about the cycle of conflict from the pre-stage through a war to the post-conflict phase, it is often faith-based groups that are providing need, providing, trying to build long-term relationships between communities and things. And that's an important role. It may not stop the bombing, it may not stop the bullets, but it may hit at some of those longer factors between communities on the ground. Well, with that, uh, I'm going to stop talking and invite Dane to come up, and we'll take some Q&A at this time. What we're going to do is, it's by that clock, it's 9.35, so our intent is to go until 10 with a Q&A conversation here, and then we'll break for 20 minutes, 10 to 10.20, and we'll be a little bit ahead of schedule so that the next panel, which actually has three speakers, can get that extra 10 minutes. So what I'd ask is, we're going to sit right here, is if you would uh, raise your hand, we'll call on one of you, and Dane's going to moderate this, and then uh, identify yourself like I asked earlier, tell us who you are and where you're from. And I would ask that uh, you keep it to a brief comment or question so we can have more people participate rather than a lengthy monologue. Fair enough? And I think we'll start with Chip Haas, I'll turn over to Dane. Yeah, hi, I'm Chip House from the Alliance for Peace Building, and this is a self-interested question. I have to write a chapter on identity conflict and peace building, and you both, in different ways, alluded to the fact that faith can be a bridge building, peace building. And Eric, you said that there weren't many examples you could turn to other than the San Diego in the Philippines. I guess the question I have, and I hope it structures what we do for the next couple days, is how do people of faith get to that point? You know, what's the transformation if it doesn't come, Eric, from a revelation from your daily? How do people make that decision to say, I'm going to work for the good of the whole rather than even the good of my community? Well, I would say this, you know, a subtext of my talk is, is that much of what goes on in issues of war and peace is religious. Right? And so religious people have the power of prayer, they have the power of giving, they have the power of their own involvement in these things. That being said, there's uh, part of what I'm trying to say is we can be smart about identifying the religious elements, and let's not pretend that all that other stuff is caused by Islam or caused by Christianity. And so I think that that's an important part to answering your question. In other words, religion isn't everything in these conflicts. And there's, I don't think that there's a single way to say that we're going to get every religion, every religious person out there to necessarily work in the trenches for peace. Uh, and that's because they may see this conflict in quite different ways than we do. Think about uh, the conflict that's gone on in Central Asia and Afghanistan and its environment. You know, people of the same general religion can see the things that have gone on in Afghanistan in a variety of different ways. And one is to say, well, this is a historic area of Islam and it's been invaded by people from the West. And so we have a duty to at least liberate our country because of who we are. And that a person could be live in that cone of Islam and want peace, give charitably, and build an orphanage and do these kinds of things that we think of as peacemaking, and yet feel like their national defense calls on them to push the Western invaders out. So what I'm suggesting is that it's, it's nuanced in any of these contexts. What I would say, though, is, is that what would help, according to Scott Appleby in his book, The Ambivalence of the Sacred, I think he's right, is, is that it would be nice if religious leaders in their communities took a stronger stand on the front end of conflict. And I don't necessarily mean as some sort of pacifist saying all conflict is bad, but saying what can we as citizens within our country do to try to decrease the kinds of things that lead to war? How can we be agents of peace around the world? 
and I was going to agree exactly with what uh, Eric said. Uh, my thoughts went to such people as uh, Gandhi or Tutu. Uh, and people take a risk, uh, and they have to actually go against the grain. I think uh, religion, obviously, is very passionate at times, especially when we're dealing with uh, international struggle war. And it's very easily easy to fall into the narrative, if you will, uh, that you know these people are evil, uh, this religion is evil, whatever. And as Christians or people of religion, speaking from my own context as uh, you know, a Christian in the Western world, uh, we have to resist that narrative and resist that uh, tendency, uh, if you will, and go against the grain sometimes. It takes a risk to actually speak up. Uh, and I think it also takes some education. Too many of our folks don't have an educated uh, understanding of what's going on in the world. Uh, one of our roles here at the Navy War College is, in fact, to educate our officers about different religions in the world, what their you know, perspective is on war and peace. And I, I see 30 or 35 uh, military students every quarter, and many of them come to the table with very, very, you know, extreme uh, misconceptions about the different religions of the world. And I see it as my job to actually correct those. <laughs> And, uh, and I think that that's true in our culture as well, that there is a, a great lack of understanding of, of, what, religion, of what people believe. Uh, and so there needs to be, as Eric pointed out, uh, an effort on the part of religious leaders not to fall into the political narratives and the passion narratives and to actually take a stand and oppose you know, the, uh, the extreme uh, take on, uh, on force and violence and to suggest you know, peace building, if you will. So I think it, it's, it takes a risk in, in the long run. Uh, next question. Comment? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much for arranging uh, this wonderful conference. Uh, my name is Mohammed Hassan Khan from Pakistan. I go to the University of San Diego for Master's in Peace and Justice Studies. Yes. And uh, in our school, there is a course uh, taught by Professor William Pettit, uh, Religion and Medicine, Dimension of Peace. And I truly understand the importance of religion in our life. Um, and I mean, it has been uh, underestimated in the policy world, I, I get it. So my question to uh, is to uh, Eric Peterson. When you mentioned that in a lot of conflicts in the world, um, religion has been politicized. I mean, the leader, leaders tell that it's truly a religious war. Uh, by that I mean that I mean, the conflict is not really over purely religious subjects. It might be political, economic, social, cultural, and others. Um, but of course, coming from Pakistan, this thing came to my mind. You know, how do you separate the Taliban conflict? I mean, and also the Al-Qaeda, the conception of Islamic empire and Islamic theory. Some people say that it might be power driven. But when I see uh, those poor people, Talibs, I mean, they really fight for religion. There is like, I mean, it, it seems to me that they don't fight for power, for political power, for supremacy. But they think that it's their, I mean, purpose in life to fight for Allah, to fight for, you know, Islam, to fight for all these things. So how do you separate? Because that thing shows that religion is inherently bad. Because it is religion, or is it a matter of like their Islam is different from us, or I mean, how do you deal with this situation? Because the kind of Islam that we believe in is not the one that is um, uh, propagated by the Taliban. So it's, it's you know, and thank you very much for it. I think that you've asked a difficult question, and often I ask an audience, do you know how Mullah Omar, who was on my first slide, you know, how did it start? Usually, no one knows. And uh, it's an interesting story to think about the, the leader of a little group of Talib's students in Kandahar, a person with no influence, who gets ticked off by the corruption in his own country. All these checkpoints in Afghanistan, thanks, uh, all these checkpoints in, Afgan in Afghanistan, the corruption in the early 1990s. And so he takes a few of his students and they go down the street to the local checkpoint and they say, we've had enough of this. And they hang that guy from the turret of an old tank. 
hey, that worked. <laughs> but they just proceeded down the road. And uh, one of the, the, the religious symbols that he used for legitimacy, and this is a guy who never claimed really to be a leader, right, in those early years and things, was the cloak of Muhammad that resides there at the local mosque in Kandahar. It's been kept for centuries. Again, not a part of briefings that the U.S. military got when they got back, <laughs> things like that, but a, a very powerful, powerful symbol uh, of righteousness and legitimacy there. And so I hesitate to say when that camera's rolling that I have any sympathy for Mullah Omar. But I, I, you know, I think that when we evaluate the kinds of things that drive people to take these first steps, that is interesting to know about the context. And so what you just mentioned about the sincerity of some of these groups, I agree. If we simply say, and this is the way U.S. foreign policy has gone, oh no, it's really not about religion. If we can just talk them about their material interests, we can negotiate something. I mean, that's not the way this works. It isn't only land or money. There's these larger questions at hand. And so to have peace in a context like this, there's only two ways. One is you just absolutely have to crush them. Or the second is that you have, there has to be a way to bring into the conversation all of these value questions that are so difficult. And over the past, since, since the beginning, so-called of these, of these peace journeys and things in 2011, I've been very skeptical of the war because neither of those have really been a part of it. It's all been power sharing and things like that. It hasn't dealt with the values questions, and the Taliban hasn't felt like they were pushed against the wall and had a need to uh, deal with this. So I would, I, I would say there's these two things. The first one is, unless they feel real pressure that they have to negotiate, then, then the conversation has to include their real concerns, their concerns are influenced by religion. And I would just comment, uh, I've had an opportunity to speak with political science scientists in our uh, culture. The uh, professor in the next office over from mine is working on his PhD right now. He's working on uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And there is a tendency on the part of political scientists and social scientists to um, ignore what you raised, and that is uh, that, in fact, people do have religious beliefs, and that they are truly and sincerely following their faith in, in doing the things that they're doing. Uh, they tend to see it more as a cynical approach that these uh, religious leaders Mullah Omar or whomever are doing this only for their own political purposes and you know, malign purposes and are manipulating the, uh, the rank and file in order to accomplish their ends. And I make the comment to, uh, to this gentleman, what happens if that gentleman is a true believer? That he is actually fighting this war because of his beliefs and that is why he's doing the things that he's doing. And he doesn't have, uh, this political scientist, doesn't have the real ability to take that into, into account. That's the realm of, of the religious of chaplains, imams, and so on and so forth. And so I think that uh, in terms of our analysis, we have to understand it. I, I appreciated Eric's uh, article uh, that he had always read in that context, looking at it from the three different levels of analysis. Let me just say that one of the ways that the U.S. has handled this in our history, you know, the first 150 years of our history, we started in the 1620s, we struggled with this. And the transition was from church and state to religion and politics. And so for the past 200 years, religion has definitely been a part of our society and politics, but it has not been a formal part of our government apparatus. Uh, because you asked specifically about this issue, do you mind if we throw a ball over to Hassan Abbas and ask, uh, as a Pakistan watcher, do you have a different answer to this question? Do you want to disagree with Tim and I? What, Hassan, what are your thoughts? No, I intend to agree to this. Um, there's no doubt, for example, just to give a brief example of uh, federally administered tribal areas. We know that it is uh, Pashtun Wali as well as uh, it is the tribalism which is at play as well. Uh, but if we look at some of the discourse of the tribals of, uh, in Waziristan, the Pakistani Taliban, so to say, Tariqe Taliban Pakistan, um, they, uh, they, some of the leaders have never been to um, some of the major seminaries in the area, but the second tier leadership, the ordinary people who are there, uh, most certainly have been influenced by uh, their view of religion. Whether I would call it, and uh, my friend would call it, a distorted version of Islam, that, that's another issue. But for those who are committing suicide bombing and others, a distorted, a, a different 
uh, stream of re religious view is most certainly having an impact. So, so I tend to agree with this larger uh, point that you're making, uh, that at one stage we have to deal with this in terms of religious language, terminology, a religion to religion issue, and that will also become very relevant when it comes to de-radicalization. Um, can you talk to a, a militant who is so inspired by his version or his extremist view um, through a secular ideas? I don't, don't think so. It will have to have a religion component in that discourse of that. Uh, next question. story, people are very surprised that the Taliban was protecting rape girls. Yes, usually. But that is what the local people yeah. accept and share and they're proud of it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Thanks. Uh, Question over here. Uh, my name is Magic Ashi. I'm a research fellow in psychiatry at the McKinney Hospital in Harvard and I teach psychology also in Boston. Um, and just a couple of uh, points is that uh, uh, the more I study about uh, psychiatry and psychology and religion in one way or another, I wonder about the connection between trauma and religion. Uh, because if you look at the beginnings of almost all religions, there is traumatic experiences that happen to certain people, like the Israelis in Egypt, uh, you know, like even the uh, Jesus with the crossing and the whole story, uh, the uh, Muslims in the beginning of Islam in Mecca. And uh, so I wonder about how trauma contributes to the formation of religion and how this trauma plays down the road, uh, you know, like, uh, like on the long term. Uh, because if you want to establish peace, we have to heal trauma. And uh, maybe these are forgotten trauma, but they are existing in these communities. But the crusades you mentioned, used by the lab when he was citing why he was doing what he's doing, trauma in history. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the thing here is that the connection between trauma and are these terrorists or whatever groups or jihadists or any uh, groups in various religions, are they trying to heal some kind of trauma by unhealthy ways, uh, by engaging in these uh, activities to restore some kind of national uh, self-esteem or respect or whatever it is that they are uh, uh, trying to do? Maybe they are doing the wrong things, but also maybe they are trying to establish some kind of uh, uh, healing process. We know in psychiatry that people who are traumatized, they tend to repeat the trauma. They traumatize other people. Uh, and they think this is healing, uh, somehow. They're sharing the trauma to someone else. Uh, so I'm wondering about that, and also about the connection between religions and revolutions. 
Because uh, on some way, I think that all religions are basically revolution, political revolution. Uh, if we look at uh, how uh, Moses helped the Israelis revolt against the power structure of Egypt, uh, how uh, Prophet Muhammad helped the Muslims revolt against Arabia, Jesus helped the uh, powers to revolt against the Roman Empire and uh, whatever structure there. So I'm kind of thinking, like, are we really missing something here by looking only at the role of religion in politics, but also maybe religion is politics? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> religion is politics. I was speaking with uh, uh, Clarence the other day. He's a historian. And uh, he, he made the comment that he teaches history and that uh, too many people forget history are not aware of it, and that we are doomed to repeat our histories as a result of that. However, uh, in, the, in many of these realms that we've talked about, uh, people are very aware of history uh, and relive the histories uh, in terms of uh, responding to whatever happened a thousand years ago or 600 years ago or 500 years ago and holding on to that historical piece uh, as a piece of their opponent. Now, in terms of actually dealing with, you know, if their motive is healing of the trauma, I'm not sure. It seems like it's, it's usually revenge. And uh, to continually inflict that kind of uh, approach. I'm not a psychiatrist. Uh, but you know, in, in the military, uh, as chaplains, we've often had to deal with you know, the direct results of trauma in war. And, uh, and of course, repeating the violence is, is not a way, as we all understand, of, uh, of healing trauma. Although maybe we're doomed to that if we don't pay attention to it. Uh, Eric, do you have any comments? I don't have much to say about on the trauma point. It, that might be a, a question in that conversation on Pope Haram this afternoon or by Catherine Marshall tomorrow. who's done a lot of work on how religious communities respond to trauma. Uh, I will say that certainly there are uh, uh, faith groups who emphasize traumatic moments in their history. Uh, and certainly many of the practices that happen in Iraq and Iran uh, Shia practices such as like Karbala, these marches and self-flagellation of things, are reenacting, in a sense, uh, a trauma narrative that is a part of their narrative. Although I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical that we could use that as a lens for all faiths. Uh, when it comes to revolution, certainly in the case of the Iranian revolution uh, in 1979, it became a, a, a format, not only for Shia, but for Sunnis as well, in the greater Middle East, of thinking about uh, what the Sun TV calls religionized politics and a, a format for trying to take over the state. Uh, and so there is a model for that. Uh, most so-called revolutions aren't truly revolutionary from a kind of political science standpoint. In other words, they're not trying to burn down an old regime and create a new one in its place. That's what the French Revolution did. That's what the Russian Revolution did. That's, in a sense, what the Chinese Revolution through the Cultural Revolution did. And the Iraqi Revolution certainly is that type of revolution. But most insurgencies, most rebels, etc., I mean, honestly, whether they're religious or not, they're thugs. Okay, one last question before we take a break. Uh, I, the first thing I saw was at the Rebecca over here. Um, Ken Yellis, a uh, consultant here in Newport. Um, as I'm listening to this, a couple of things have uh, crossed my mind. One is the sort of, you know, I'm going to insert some new language in the discussion, like we need more language. <laughs> um, uh, one phrase that came to mind is going back to my graduate school days a really long time ago, uh, Eros and Platypus. I mean, a lot of what we're talking about is the war between love and death, and, and you know, um, it, it feels like this is a theme that's repeated through the conversation, looking for ways of healing or, or being inclusive versus looking for ways of keeping something intact, something valued intact by killing somebody. Um, the other thing that occurs to me is that, in a sense, what we're talking about is not so much religion as cosmology. You have a story of the world. You have a story of the universe. And then a counter story develops. Somebody is saying when a revolutionary religion appears, the story of the world we've been listening to is wrong. 
we have, we have to change the story. And we have to keep changing it until the new, new story takes hold. And sometimes that involves a lot of killing. Um, because everybody else is buying into the old story. And you know the only way to change them is by imposing this new narrative on them. I don't know if that's helpful or if it just makes things more complicated. Uh, but religion doesn't quite describe what's going on here. It's more like it's a paradigm shift going on, how you think the universe operates. And you have to establish not just a, a new way of understanding reality, uh, and, and the, because it's a desperate enterprise, it feels like only force will get you there, only violence will get you there. Yes, we were. I think you got a question. No, there was a hand over there. Go ahead. Yeah. One last one. Just, I uh, wonder if you might comment on how what you both talked about is impacted by what is the, described as the post Westphalian period. <laughs> Could you be able to just slightly more specific? <laughs> well, just, uh, just uh, we're dealing with these issues now where there's not a state. Mm. There's a transnational organization right. like Al Qaeda or something. And so, how do we address some of these things when there is no state? Non state actors and so on. I actually think that's the topic of the next panel. <laughs> because the next panel is really about how to think about uh, religious affairs at a strategic level, particularly from the, from the seat of U.S. national security decision making. So, if you don't mind, I think I'd actually pass it off to, uh, I think Tim Dewey's going to answer that one, Mary. Okay, we're going to take a break now. We're going to break until 10.20. And so we have refreshments available for you. And take uh, this opportunity to, again, uh, continue the conversation.